We are so glad you're here with us today. Welcome to Probable Meets Possible. The Bell Museum and the College of Biological Sciences launched this series nearly two years ago to bring together University of Minnesota scientists in bio-based fields to talk about the probable challenges we face and the possible advances that could have a profound impact on our future. These conversations, which you can find in a playlist on the Bell Museum's YouTube channel, have engaged audiences in exciting conversations about microbial communication, life in extreme environments, climate change, and more. My name is Holly Menninger, and I'm the Director of Public Engagement and Science Learning at the Bell Museum. We're proud to be Minnesota State Natural History Museum and a public gateway to research at the University of Minnesota. Our mission at the Bell, which I should say we are now celebrating our 150th anniversary this year, is to ignite curiosity and wonder, explore our connections between nature and the universe, and create a better future for our evolving world. And today, with the help of our scientist guests, we'll explore how advances in technology are revolutionizing current and future approaches to conservation and natural resource management. We are grateful to our partners in this series, the College of Biological Sciences, led by Dean Valerie Forbes, and the college's communications team, including Stephanie Zenos and Claire Wilson. So thank you. Now, let me introduce our guest today. Sarah Hubner is the research manager for the Snapshot Safari Citizen Science Project. Or, blah, 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 I'm getting all tongue-tied for the Snapshot Safari Citizen Science Project and is a graduate researcher with the University of Minnesota Lion Center. Sarah is working with Microsoft on technology that processes camera trap images as part of her work with Snapshot Safari. Dr. Alexis Grindy is a wildlife ecologist and research program manager in the Avian Ecology Lab at the Natural Resources Research Institute in Duluth. Her research focuses on developing innovative ways to conserve bird populations through habitat and land management. Our topic today is conservation in real time. This afternoon, Sarah and Alexis will provide a brief overview of their research and offer up insights about how advances in technology will continue to be a real game changer in co for conservation. We'll have brief presentations from each researcher and then we're gonna open up the floor to conversation. A few technical notes. Uh, we'll ask you to send in your questions and comments directly to the panelists through the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our team's gonna be behind the scenes monitoring and curating those for conversation. You may have also noticed that we have turned live captioning on today. If you find that distracting, you can go ahead and hide it by clicking on the live transcript CC button um, at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this webinar and we'll also uh, be putting it online on the Bell Museum's YouTube channel. Okay, so let's start by turning it over to Sarah Hubner from the University of Minnesota Lion Center. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Holly. Thanks for having me. So let me share my screen. All right, and as Holly mentioned, I am a graduate researcher with the University of Minnesota Lions Center. And I work with Dr. Craig Packer, who is the founder of the Lion Center, and he has studied lions in the Serengeti National Park since the 1970s. And specifically, my research interests center on reintroduction of megafauna and the cascading effects on ecological stability, functionality, and biodiversity. So even as many large mammal species are threatened with extinction by human activities, we are just beginning to understand how entire ecosystems are affected when predators like lions and mega herbivores like elephants that exert top-down effects on other organisms are either reintroduced to degraded ecosystems or become locally extinct. For my dissertation research, I'm studying behavioral and environmental interactions of elephants in South Africa, one of the few places in the world where elephant populations are actually growing and they're being actively reintroduced to areas of previous extirpation, often at the same time as lions and other large mammals. So you may have heard about the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone National Park here in the US and how they created a landscape of fear that changes the distribution and density of other animals. Lions do this too, but elephants who are released from predation due to their size seem to mitigate those effects since they don't change their foraging habits in response to lions. So elephants exert big effects wherever they go, and it's important for us to understand how herbivores of this size affect things, 
since they are largely extinct in most biomes on Earth. So we know that elephants are agents of change that maintain heterogeneity in savannas and affect many ecological functions through their foraging and migration. What I seek to understand is how elephants affect other animals and plants at the patch level, both on a daily basis and over long periods of time, because that has profound implications for biodiversity and conservation success. To give some examples, here are a few organisms that elephants exert cascading effects on through their foraging behaviors. So black rhinos are one of the primary resource competitors with elephants because they also browse woody plants. Interactions between these two species can be positive or negative. Elephants decrease browse availability for rhinos, but they also form new paths through thickets that rhinos can use and widen to access additional plants. And there tends to be a high selection of elephant impacted patches by large browsers like giraffe and kudu, and by smaller ungulates like impala. But each of these species selects particular um, to the type of elephant damage. Trees heavily browsed by elephants produce shoots of higher nutritional quality, which facilitates smaller browsers like diker and steambok. And it also facilitates grazers of all body sizes. And even predator, and longe predator longevity and reproductive success can be affected by elephants. As a couple of recent studies have found that lions have greater hunting success in thickets that have been browsed by elephants likely due to the creation of new ambush sites. And even birds, reptiles, and insects are affected by elephants since they're a keystone species in savannas. So how do I study all this and make sense of extremely complex natural systems? With the help of remote sensing, artificial intelligence, and citizen science. Within just the past decade, ecologists have begun to deploy remote sensors across the globe to monitor wildlife and habitats at unprecedented scales. These sensors are an improvement from traditional data collection methods, which involve walking transects or flying helicopters to count animals. Both of these methods were time consuming, expensive, and typically resulted in undercounts due to animals avoiding humans on foot or in the air. Using remote sensing technology, we can collect data on wildlife 24 seven, 365 at a fraction of the cost and in a minimally invasive manner. The sensors that we're using include wildlife cameras or what we call camera traps that record images and videos, GPS and radio collars that provide hourly location data on wild animals, bioacoustic sensors that record vocalizations and can be used to triangulate positions, and drones to immediately locate the herds, prides, and poachers. For the long-term ecological monitoring that we've undertaken with Snapshot Safari, my collaborators and I set out large-scale grids of camera traps in cells of five kilometers squared throughout 45 protected areas in South Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, Kenya, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. These motion activated cameras run continuously, allowing us to evaluate African wildlife on an unprecedented scale, both spatially and temporally. We capture around 80 mammal species in most of the reserves where we work. Every site uses standardized protocols to facilitate cross-site comparisons, which allow us to answer questions related to animals' distribution and density, including where they spend most of their time and how the presence of humans and other animals affects behaviors like foraging and vigilance. So the majority of our sites have been running since 2018, <clears throat> although our flagship project in the Serengeti has been running since 2010, and my field sites in and around Kruger National Park, South Africa have been up since 2017. The camera traps take three images in quick succession during the day and one at night, which we call capture events. Taking multiple images allows us to better see what the animals are doing and which direction they're moving. We can also pick up some interesting behaviors like this elephant giving herself a head scratch on a tree. Snapshot cameras produce what's known as big data on the scale of 3 million observations in a single year and growing as we add more sites. 
But there's a mismatch between the amount of data we're collecting and the time that we ecologists have to sift through and analyze it. So that's where artificial intelligence comes in. We turn to AI in the form of machine learning algorithms to automatically identify animals in images, and particularly to help us quickly separate blank images and those with animals in them. To train an algorithm to automatically identify species, you need a lot of examples to show it, particularly because different habitats and backgrounds can confuse it. Due to the scale and length of our study, we have millions of labeled images that we present to a deep to deep learning neural networks to train them to perform this task. At this point, more than a dozen species classifiers for African wildlife have been trained using our camera trap data. I currently employ two machine learning algorithms on camera trap images as they come in from the field. One is an object detector that decides whether an animal is present or not. The other is a classifier that provides a series of predictions as to which animal is in each capture. The AI is not yet sufficiently advanced to provide all of the labels that ecologists need to get the most out of the data we've collected. So we also work with citizen scientists on the crowdsourcing platform Zooniverse, who help us to ensure that the AI's labels are correct and to provide more detail on the number of animals in each capture, as well as observable behaviors and demographics. So when I upload images to Zooniverse, I include a manifest that has the AI's predictions on it. There, citizen scientists classify the images using a customized menu like this for each reserve. And I use a series of retirement rules to determine the number of people who need to classify each capture. If the AI is highly confident that an image is blank and two volunteers agree, that capture will be taken out of circulation and labeled blank. There are similar rules for animals that are very easy for both AI and humans to identify, either because they're easily recognizable like elephants and zebras or abundant like wildebeest and impala. We get fewer pictures of rare and reclusive animals. So we circulate those for more human classifications to ensure that we get the correct label. Once that data comes back from Zooniverse fully labeled by our volunteer corps, we can use that to train the AI to be more accurate the next time, particularly on the rare species it hasn't seen as much. But there are so many things AI can't tell us about our data, especially when we have images with multiple species in them or when animals exhibit different behavior than we've seen before. So this is an example of an extended series of images that show meerkats and a yellow mongoose sharing vigilance which is not something that had been previously documented. Our citizen scientists noticed and pointed it out to me and the example made its way into a publication. So the public are participating in research in a very meaningful way. We've also documented animals outside of their known ranges, which is a trend we expect to continue as climate change ramps up. So our hybrid approach combined harnesses the best of both worlds, the speed and precision, precision of AI combined with the pattern recognition and ability to spot outliers of our human volunteers. So the advances in the field of deep learning for the purposes of ecological monitoring have been truly impressive over the last decade, and I expect them to continue accelerating throughout the next. At this point, it's very important for ecologists and mach machine learning developers to collaborate to ensure that the AI in development is useful and returns accurate results quickly so that we can make adjustments to conservation strategies as climate change causes rain shifts and puts greater stressors on wild populations. So in addition to expanding the models, as I've explained in my slide, uh, um, there are a few other projects in development which have exciting implications for the future. Uh, one is that some researchers are trying to embed AI directly into cameras so that real-time alerts can be relayed to a ranger station whenever a certain species like a rhino or a human who might be a poacher passes by a fixed camera location. Other developers are working to incorporate statistical models that ecologists already use, like occupancy models, into machine learning outputs so that we would get automated reports on species richness, diversity, and interactions. Uh, 
And yet another project is using machine learning to predict movement trajectories to sense not just where animals are, but where they're going. So there's probably many more uses that we haven't even thought of yet for AI and conservation. So I really look forward to seeing all of the ways that we can use AI to benefit the natural world. And if you're interested in checking out some more photos, you can join us at Snapshot Safari or the Lion Center website. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I'm going to incur encourage our audience members to use the chat box, which lots of folks have, um, to ask their questions. I'm going to take a moment as we're transitioning to ask a, a follow-up question, if I may, Sarah. So you kind of alluded to, um, as you're talking about the future and how to incorporate uh, machine learning into the camera traps themselves to alert um, you know, local folks, folks on the ground. And my, my question was really about, you know, how is the work that you're doing now with this vast, these vast arrays of camera traps and all these data, is it informing any of the local management or conservation work that's happening? Is there feedback between those two things? Yeah, it definitely is. So whenever we get these images in, we return them back out with the full reports to reserve managers. And so they can use those to assess population trends from year to year. Um, and we're working on trying to identify like poaching hotspots. We think that's an important one for kind of giving the rangers direction as they go forward. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, we will have plenty of time for more questions, so keep those coming in, folks. We really appreciate those. Um, right now, we'll transition to our next speaker, Dr. Alexis Grindy. Uh, Alexis, go for it. Floor is yours. Thank you, Holly. Um, thanks, Sarah. That was so interesting. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to talk to you today about um, probable meets possible, and I added in the word bird con conservation because that is definitely what I focus on. Um, like Holly mentioned, I run the avian ecology lab up at the Natural Resources Research Institute at uh, the University of Minnesota Duluth, and really our or our research focuses on largely bird conservation. But really what we try to do is use birds as ecosystem indicators to inform restoration, um, forest management, land use changes to figure out what they're actually telling us about our environment. So all of my research is sort of um, couched in this idea that we're really in this, uh, this time frame of the world where we're losing a lot of biodiversity, and we have been for quite a while. And that's uh, happening in Minnesota. And how we're seeing that is generally a decline in a lot of populations of different species that have been more abundant in previous um, or historical times. And as those populations continue to decline, we're sort of putting them on endangered or threatened species or species of conservation concern. And eventually, we're going to start losing these species from the ecosystem unless we you know do a lot of uh, focused effort to try to conserve them so habitat loss is a major threat to biodiversity this isn't news and it's been sort of the narrative for a very long time uh, and that's widely true across taxa um, for birds there was a, a a study that came out in 2019 from Rosenberg and et al and they reported that nearly three billion birds are gone compared to the 1970s when we really started monitoring birds. And these decline were across a lot of different bird groups that use a lot of different habitat types. And one of the only um, bird sort of groups that have increased are birds that use wetland habitat. And I think that's really exciting. And because we did a lot of conservation efforts for wetland habitat, related to ducks and wetland restoration in this time frame. And so I think that means that even though some bird populations are declining, we still have a lot of hope and we can try to increase some of these populations across um, these large scales. Now, um, the concern for birds is huge for me and my lab and should be for anybody who lives in Minnesota as well, because Minnesota is a breeding hotspot for birds. And it's one of the biggest breeding hotspots in all of North America. We have a very diverse group of birds that migrate all the way from different parts of um, the globe, really, to breed in the summertime. And that's when a lot of my research focuses as well. Now, 
studying birds is tricky because we look at their breeding season, um, which is mostly what birds are here for. Of course, if you go outside now, you don't hear a lot of birds. There are a few uh, winter birds that are brave and stick around for the winter, but most of them go south for the winter. So they're here in the winter, they're here breeding in the summer. They migrate south to southern part of the United States, um, Central and South America. They overwinter and then they prepare for their spring migration. And when they get here, they breed. Now, in the past 10, 15 years, there's been a tremendous advancement in different types of technologies for us to be able to learn what are these birds doing? How are they getting from point A to point B? How are they um, getting from the breeding grounds and where are they overwintering? What are the migration routes that they're taking? And it's been really exciting and it's fascinating. And those technologies are what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, including some of my research um, on a lot of different bird species. And it'll be a, a pretty broad level overview um, and I'll try and integrate some of the conservation work or outcomes that we're getting from tracking some of these birds as well. So one of the most versatile types of technologies is called a light level geolocator and it's great because it's very small and it basically just goes around the leg of a bird. This is a common turn that's being um, banded out on Interstate Island in Duluth and the uh, the geolocators are basically just miniature data loggers and they're logging um, light. And so as the bird goes from Minnesota down to the um, to South America and specifically Peru, you know, it logs the different levels of light that it's having throughout the day. And we can line that up with sunrise, sunset time periods, and we can get a pretty broad assessment of where these birds were and where they stayed and how long they were there. And this information and this map is from um, Annie Bracey, who works in my lab, and she got her PhD just recently uh, down in the Twin Cities on some of this common turn work. Uh, the limitations of the geolocators is that you have to recapture the bird and sometimes birds just don't come back to where they were captured. And so, um, so you have to make sure that you're going to have a study system where these birds will return. Turns are colonial nesters and so they always come back to the same place um, year after year. So some of the more exciting things that are really recent are using GPS and GSM tags, which are cell phone tags, um, to track birds. Now these are relatively big and there's a limitation on battery size, so you can only use it on larger birds, but we've been doing it on some different species that I'll walk through. And basically the gist is, is you catch these birds in different ways, depending on what the species is. Uh, you band them and then you attach these transmitters. Um, this is a GPS transmitter, an Argo satellite transmitter, and this is um, uh, sort of like a backpack, either it goes over their arm or wings or sort of it's like a saddle that they can put around their legs depending on the species. Um, and once activated, the satellite tags send information up to a satellite or to a cell phone uh, tower where it can then be downloaded. So either way, um, we're tracking in almost real time. It's not as awesome as some of the mammals where they can wear the collars and you can get real time information, um, but that's just because of the battery limitations. Um, one of the species that we've been studying a lot is the American woodcock. It's had a lot of population declines. This, hopefully you guys can hear that. That is what an American woodcock looks like and sounds like. It is definitely like a sign of spring in Minnesota. They're relatively common. Um, they do winter down in southern parts of the United States and then migrate up to Minnesota. And they just love to breed in the northern parts of the, the forested areas in Minnesota. Um, so here's a picture of some woodcock and uh, with that are tagged. You can just see how the, the tag sort of sits on the back of the woodcock and the antenna um, just sort of hanging off. Our woodcock right now are, that we've tagged in the fall are wintering and have survived the hunting season and um, are have so far doing very well. And we're excited to see if they're gonna come back to the same breeding locations that they used the previous year. We call that site fidelity. And it really helps to uh, inform different habitat management practices across the landscape. Another species that we work with is the sharp-tailed grouse, and we've been working with these guys in Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, the populations of sharp-tailed grouse have declined really sharply. Um, here's a sharp-tailed grouse lecking. They sort of do this dancing behavior and uh, blow up uh, like these fancy feathers and um, pouches on their neck to show off for females. 
we tagged, um, we used satellite tags and we put some on some males and females to see how they were using this breeding area called the lecking ground. We were able to um, get some biometric data from the, the cell phone tags too and see where the female was nesting. And it's really helped inform conservation um, or habitat management for conservation. So we are learning more about how they're using the landscape throughout the breeding season. What are they avoiding? Um, where are they going? Where are they not going? And already they've been using this information to change some of the forest management practices, um, specifically in Bayfield County. So it's really exciting. Um, a graduate student at the University of Minnesota Duluth in the IBS program, her name is uh, Hannah Tutangi. She is studying northern hawk owls. Northern hawk owls are this amazing species that are really um, almost nothing is known about them for the most part. They are a boreal breeder and they'll hang out in like areas like Saxon Bog, but really up in Canada is where they're in higher densities, but across the landscape, there's just not a ton of them. And so we just don't, they're really hard to study. And so this winter she was able to capture, um, I think seven Northern Hawk Owls and put on GPS transmitters and they're doing great. And they've been on for a couple of months, depending on the bird. And um, she's getting so much interesting information, including, again, how are they using the landscapes? Are they using these forest fragmentation? What's happening um, in terms of a uh, cover type? Are they using urban areas? Like what, what are they avoiding? What are they using? And it's going to be super awesome to figure out how they change their habitat use um, as they prepare for the breeding season here in a couple of weeks, really. Um, if you're interested in that, she has an Instagram page for the project, and so you should check that out. Now, a lot of the birds that we're concerned about are, are way too small to carry around GPS or GSM tags, which is a bummer, but hopefully that'll be an innovation into the future. And so a lot of the work that we do tracking birds uses just VHF radio tags. Now, this technology has been around for a long time, but there's been small advancements um, in battery size that allows us to put on these transmitters to even the smallest birds like chickadees, um, and, and they can safely wear them for a certain amount of time. Um, we use either handheld telemetry where we're going out in the woods, for example, and tracking them down and figuring out what, what the birds are, are using, where they're hanging out. But we also have these larger units called automated telemetry units that we've set up throughout, some of them throughout Minnesota, especially on the North Shore where we have a lot of migrating birds. Um, and those uh, automated telemetry stations are part of a larger collaborative network called the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System. And it's really just a group of researchers that are interested in bird migration and specifically those birds that we, we can't use a lot of different technologies on. But they're deployed, especially in the um, Eastern United States, they're in relatively high densities. And then we're getting more and more online within um, in Mexico, Central America, Southern, uh, Southern South America, sorry. and uh, what happens was when these birds that are tagged fly by, basically the um, computer that this is attached to logs it and then you can go and download the data and see what bird flew by when and it, if it flies by a variety of these different um, telemetry units, then we can go ahead and sort of get a migration path. And so this map is from common turns that we tagged again in, in um, Minnesota, and it's very similar to the output that we were getting from the geolocators, and so it's a really great advancement for tracking some of these smaller birds. Now, a lot of my research focuses on the breeding season because that's when the most diverse breeding bird communities are here. And it's really important to try and get it from this egg to hatchling to what we call the fledgling when they actually leave the nest stage and then get them to basically that adult um, abilities in terms of flying and feeding and being independent of their parents as they prepare for migration. Um, they're is a lot of risk to being a fledgling moving around in a forest. There's a lot of things that will eat you. And if you can't get somewhere safe, there's a lot of storms that will kill you. And so we're really focusing on um, trying to quantify fledgling mortality and figuring out ways that forest management can um, mitigate some of the, the predation or the exposure to the elements that might happen for birds at this fledgling stage. Um, we're doing this on a lot of different bird species, including juvenile American woodcock, um, Connecticut warbler that breed in the forested peatlands in Minnesota and boreal chickadee. Uh, my graduate student Kara Snow is working on boreal chickadee. Um, Beery is a common forest bird that has had population declines, but I wanted to focus on um, the species called the golden wing warbler and my graduate student Brett Howland is really focusing on their breeding ecology um, 
this this year and next year. The golden wing warbler is um, one of the most threatened songbirds in all of North America. And in fact, it's um, being considered or going to be considered for threatened or endangered status at the national level. Um, and what's really important is that it um, has its highest breeding densities in Minnesota. And so over 50% of the population breeds in Minnesota and they depend on our forests. And so what we do for forest management has a huge effect on their overall conservation. Um, and the big thing that again, we're focusing on is that if we don't get fledglings to survive past that sort of um, really delicate stage, we won't ever increase the population. And so we're doing a lot of intensive studies. Um, this is a, a juvenile golden wing warbler <laughs> trying to learn how to fly. You can see it's not super successful, right? It's sort of like a, um, a young baby trying to walk, right? It needs a little bit of practice, but of course that's when it's very vulnerable. Um, this is a picture of um, a fledgling that we were trying to track and it just happened to walk upon it when it was getting eaten by a garter snake. There are a lot of predators in the forest that want to eat baby birds. Um, and they're, again, because they're not super mobile for the first um, about 25 days, they don't have um, they have a, a lot of risk for dying, right? And But we're figuring out that there are some habitat management recommendations, denser brush, for example, that um, allow them to hide a little bit more and seems to increase their survival. And so that's a continuing study that we're excited to learn more about. This is a little bit older of a golden wing warbler that is still dependent on the parents. And as you can see, it's more mobile, it's more coordinated, it's still being fed. But this bird has a very high chance of surviving and infected, and we think it um, ended up migrating south just as, as young birds should. So that is very hopeful. So looking into the future of bird research, um, I think there's a lot of really exciting innovations and, and the continuation of some of the things that have been developing over the past 10, 15 years. One of those is eBird. Um, if any of you are birders, you might know eBird. And if you are um, interested in learning more about birds, it's a wonderful resource. All the maps that I was showing um, about the changes in the distribution of some of those birds were via eBird um, maps. And basically it's based on big science collected by citizens that are out birding and um, enter it into this eBird e -board database. And then scientists, data scientists are using it to figure out and map um, migration routes, abundance, hotspot locations, and target conservation efforts. It's really exciting. Um, there's been huge improvements in radar for tracking bird migration. Um, you can even see, you used to be able to just see like these sort of clouds moving over and be like, oh, those are birds. But the, um, some of the technologies have advanced so much that now we can see the different size classes of birds. And eventually I'm, I'm sure they're going to be developed enough that you, maybe you could even pick out some uh, morphometric features and, and actually figure out what birds are flying over at any given time. That's gonna be awesome. There's going to be a continued miniaturization of GPS tags, and I, I hope I'm still uh, doing research on birds at that point in time, because I just love to have that really high level detailed information about some of these small songbirds that we work with. And at some point in time, I think there's going to be an integration of citizen science and tracking technology, where maybe you could host a MODIS station on your house and see the birds that are flying over that are tagged. Um, where do they come from? Where are they going to? Is it a female, a male? Uh, is it a juvenile? And you can really be um, sort of interacting with the environment that way. Um, I think that's maybe a little further off on the horizon, but I, I do think it's an exciting um, uh, potential future that could happen. At any rate, all this. Um, all this information is just helping us learn more about birds, really focus in on some of the conservation efforts that we can do to conserve these species that are specifically in greatest conservation need. And I, I love the saying so much, wherever there are birds, there's hope. And I think that um, bird conservation is really um, hope filled right now. And hopefully all of this new technology can be used to maximize conservation efforts and conserve birds into the future. Um, this is a viri that's going to be fed by a parent, which is so great. But I would like to thank all of the wonderful people that I work with. Um, Annie Bracey, Steve Colby, Josh Bedner, Debbie Peterson, Ryan Steiner, Reed Sievers, Stephen Nelson, and then gr the graduate students in the IBS program, Kara Snow, Brett Howland, and Hannah Tutangi. They are awesome and go out in the field and find all these birds and take them and follow them around and get all that data. But thank you so much, and I'm happy to take questions. Awesome. Thank you, Alexis.
Uh, and just a reminder to our audience, we would love to hear of your questions. That'll be the fuel for the, the conversation. Maybe before we bring Sarah into the conversation, just a follow-up question for Alexis, uh, one that I shared with Charles, one of our viewers. Um, you showed us a few videos of the birds. And so we were wondering um, how do you, it looks like maybe you all are integrating some camera trap data with the tracking sensor data. Wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yes, indeed we are. Yeah, we use um, high uh, resolution cameras and we put them out and on the nests when we know that there's something exciting that might be happening. For example, hatching um, and when they're re getting ready to fledge. And then we do it at some points in time during the nestling period too to quantify how often the, the parents are sort of bringing food back to the um, fledglings. And we think that has a lot of information, holds a lot of information to sort of assess habitat quality. Um, you know, if the parents are gone for hours at a time, they're not finding food, they have to probably travel a big distance. And of course that has um, overall implications Applications for the survival of the juveniles. And so we have been using these exactly camera trap data to, um, to document behavior and also then predation events, which is more of a bummer than, yeah. <laughs> than that seeing. That snake image was uh, kind of, kind of freaked me out, made me a little bit sad uh, yeah. for, for that. Well, so uh, Sarah, why don't you join in? The questions are, are coming in. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take my host privilege here and ask a couple more questions. Um, I, so you both talked about technology that is accumulating lots and lots of data. Like, where does that data go? <clears throat> like, is storage actually an issue for you? Do you hang on to it? Talk to me about that whole big thing. Oh my gosh, it's such an issue. I So we use the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. That's where I run the machine learning models. I had 20 terabytes of storage and I am always bumping up against that cap. So it's like, Almost as soon as it's processed, I have to move it up and make room for more. So it's definitely something to be concerned with. Um, it's one of the reasons we haven't moved to video yet. We would sort of love to do video, but it's just so much even bigger. So we would need like 100 terabytes. And so um, hoping that we can get some better compression out of future images. Yeah, well, and compared are you to running into it too? yeah, compared to Sarah, I'm sure our <laughs> data issues are minimal. But uh, it's one of the reasons we don't um, like have continuous videos on some of our nests is because we just can't deal with all of that data. Um, it is tricky. I don't think there's a great solution, and it's sort of uh, the the data is gr grew before there was a lot of great solutions. Um, but hopefully, it'll keep improving into the future. Yeah. Well, so that, that kind of leads me to another question. I mean, I think sort of coming into your talk today, I was operating under this assumption that like technology is awesome. We can learn all these things and it helps us to learn more and to do more and protect more. And I was wondering about sort of, are there any drawbacks or challenges related beyond the data storage issue um, to using these high tech approaches for studying animals, whether they're breeding birds or elephants. Yeah, I mean, for us, security is actually a problem. So when you're posting images online of threatened species, you have to be really careful that your location data isn't available. Um, so we have to strip all of that out. And then so we, it's the metadata, we take that out, we encrypt it to go into Zooniverse. And then when it comes back, we, um, you know, unite those again. Um, but this is something, and maybe you've heard about this, Holly, but like there have been some crowdsourcing platforms where they tried to make everything super open source and like available for everybody, available for the public. And um, I think it was eBird who decided they had to like change the way that they were sharing because of issues like that, where people were finding and um, taking rare birds. So I don't know if that sounds right to you, Alexis, but that's what I had heard. Yeah, that's uh, that is right. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, people would post a location of a bird and then um, whether it was for just, you know, massive amounts of birders that would go there and sort of endangered the bird in some way, shape or form. So a lot of um, species uh, locations, specific locations are hidden um, and sort of summed up to county level um, a lot of the times. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the technology, you know, a lot of the technology for tracking birds is is new. Um, 
And there's a there's a failure rate that happens anytime you use technology. And when you spend so much time um, finding NAS and buying tags and getting money to do all the research, and then the tag just stops working a day or two into it, um, it is very heartbreaking. Um, and hopefully that will just continue to improve into the future. Uh, but that is an issue. We also have um, things that are called autonomous recording units. And so those are like basically, um, yeah, recording units that you, we put out, but it just record, records audio out in the forest. And we, uh, those will sometimes, we rely on them to sort of get information about birds throughout the breeding season. Sometimes they'll just fail and it's a bummer, but it is a risk that you have to take. And I guess my um, big take home always is every piece of technology has trade-offs and they're, um, you just kind of have to hedge your bets to make sure you're getting the data that you need at the lowest level. And then if technology works and everything's awesome, then that's a bonus for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a major attrition level. So like for camera traps in particular, elephants hate camera traps. So if they see one, they will just like knock it down and stomp on it. Um, we have to be careful about where we put them so humans don't see them because we've had both poachers take them or just like curious people are like, I want to see what's on this camera trap. So they take the, the whole thing. And then even if you've just, it's been working great, you've had it out there for five years getting beat down by the African sun, like it just goes kaput once in a while. And so you think that you have like, okay, I got my equipment budget, everything's out there. And then like a few years in, you're like, great, I have to, I have to buy a whole bunch more equipment to keep everything running. Yeah. There's a lot of infrastructure that I think you have to stay on, on top of. Um, one of our viewers, Charles was asking Sarah, what kind of, um, I'm going to make this a two-part question. What kind of AI neural network software are you using? And I'd be curious, Alexis, if you're using any machine learning or AI tools uh, to help with the processing of, of your big data. Yeah, so we don't use a specific platform. We have a custom one that a machine learning developer worked with me to build. And so we use the supercomputer here at the university um, and it's based on ResNet architecture. So it's a very common uh, deep learning architecture. That's sort of the basis for most neural networks. Um, so we don't use any particular software. It's all custom and we do that in Python. Got it. Alexis, are you using any of those kinds of tools to, to work process your data? Um, not at not at the same level that Sarah is. We do use machine learning approaches for um, predicting species distributions and that sort of thing. Um, we do have a lot of camera traps that uh, information that, that we have set up and to um, document uh, like species during migration at certain feature locations. But we have not got to the machine learning portion of that project yet. And I'm hoping like there'll be something widely available on let's say uh, like a platform like the university could share so we could just plug our pictures in and not do the development part of it. Yeah. Uh, somebody, Jeremy wanted to know, like, was that Py just confirming Python and, oh, you wrote back. Perfect. Um, <laughs> people are really, in, people are really interested in that, that piece of it. I, I'm curious, uh, you know, technology is such important tools for the research that you're using. I'm curious, like through your, your training and background, did you imagine that you would go, did you get into this field because you were interested in technology or did you get into this field because you were interested in wildlife and how did those like things come together for you? I'm curious. Yeah, I did not come to graduate school to be a coder. And so I was kind of surprised at how much coding I ended up needing to do. Um, so it was very much coming from a place of wildlife conservation, wanting to save threatened and endangered animals. And um, coming into the lab, working with Craig, he had the Serengeti project that was going when I started. And then we expanded it to all of these other sites. So it was just sort of a natural evolution that this is what we needed to do to get the job done and to do it at this scale. Yeah. Yeah, and um, when I started being interested in, in wildlife conservation, I definitely thought it was more um, you know, on the ground binoculars, seeing really amazing things. And definitely my world exists on the computer and learning technology and failing miserably at learning technology a lot of the times. Um, 
but I, uh, you know, really when, right when I finished my PhD there, it was when um, a lot of these new technologies were coming out. And so it's, it's just a constant like learning, okay, now this tag and this one does this and this one does this and what are the limitations of all of them? Um, I never get bored and I'm always feeling um, very, excited about the next big thing and seeing if it sort of has less limitations than the current big thing. So um, yeah, it's a skill set that I never dreamed a lot like Sarah too, like coding, whatever. I mean, those are things that I never dreamed of or even heard of when I was like an undergraduate. So, but yeah. good at it now. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Devin was wondering how long, I mean, my guess is there may be some young people watching, how long have each of you been doing research in your respective fields? Um, so I started graduate school in 2016, so going on six years now. Yeah, um, so I did um, my undergraduate research in Hawaii in the early 2000s and then um, got my master's degree again in the like early 2000s to 2005. And then I took a break because I had a kid and then I got my PhD um, uh, a, a couple of years later. So it's been a, a long road and I've been currently in this position for about five years, but uh, yeah, I mean, 20 years, I guess is, is the correct answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. Le uh, okay. I have to ask the question. This is, this is maybe a fun question. What's been the most surprising thing that, how, that you've learned? Um, maybe cause I, there's, I had a previously, I know another wildlife biologist and was always telling me stories of these crazy tracks that some bird took that was so unexpected. So I'm curious with, with your respective, um, approaches, what, what was the, the wackiest, weirdest, coolest, I don't care. You, you decide the est thing that, um, most unexpected thing that you've discovered. Go ahead, Alexis. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the most surprising things, um, that we captured on film or on one of our, our um, video traps was we ha we were studying viri um, which is like a thrush species and um, we were looking at the documentation of the nest and it, um, American robins who are kind of related to viris were coming in and feeding the baby viris and so um, the these hatchlings had four parents that were coming in like two viri and two American Robin, and we think what happened is that the robin nest failed, you know, it, it is in the forest. And so um, like, I think the, the robin nest failed. And I don't know if it's just the parental hormones or what the heck was going on, but we have, um, that was surprising and really interesting and cool. And the very parents didn't seem to really mind the little bit of extra help, but like that, um, that helping each other out, it takes a village thing, I guess maybe <laughs> this kind of happens in the bird world. I was surprised. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, what have you observed? And maybe that doesn't have to be the most. I don't, I was being yeah, no. something. So I'm, it's not technology related, but it, it took me by surprise. So um, the very first time I was in the field in South Africa, I was deploying my camera trap grids and it was like 7 a.m. And I'm out there putting out my very first camera and I'm all focused on what I'm doing. And um, the ranger I was working with says, Sarah, drop your stuff, get in the truck. And I was like, what line? He's like, there's elephants right there. These elephants had snuck up on us. They were like 10 feet away and you cannot hear elephants. Like you would think you would hear them approaching through the brush, but they have these really cool feet that like balloon out at the bottom. So it protects their foot from getting broken every time they step on it with all that bulk. And because it has that little bit of cushion, it makes them very silent. So Elephants are sneaky, they're quiet, cool, that's clever, amazing. awesome. So yeah. That, so that's that's fantastic. Uh, also <laughs> yeah. terrifying. I was gonna <laughs> say, like to have 10 elephants just like sneak up on you right over there uh is is wild. Um wow. So I uh Max asked a question for Alexis, but I'm wondering. I think we can broaden it out to the, to the larger group, because Sarah, you were showing that sort of elephants exist within this larger ecosystem and connected and have impacts on, on other, other animals. Um, so Max's question was, how do you balance the modifications to conservation techniques in the interest of birds with their effects on the rest of the ecosystem? So kind of going back to things are, are connected and, and something that you do to protect birds or protect elephants. Um, how does that affect other organisms within that particular ecosystem. 
Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And um, we could broaden it out even more and think about, you know, with NRI, we're Natural Resource Research Institute. And so we're thinking about um, using natural resources in the economic realm as well. And so, you know, a lot of the work we do is on state land where, you know, forestry provides money to the state. And so it's it's really balancing, okay, what does this species need? And we, we kind of have a, um, I, I want to say like, keep common things common because they're a really great indicator of ecosystem health and do whatever you can for those species that are declining, which unfortunately are a lot of them. And for something like the boreal chickadee, for example, they depend on really old um, and dense black spruce forests, but black spruce is also a, a timber product that Minnesota um, uses quite a bit. And so trying to talk with those foresters and figure out, well, what can we do? What are sort of the middle ground that maybe boreal chickadees would still um, use the habitat and you still can extract the timber out of it? Um, and maybe, you know, and it's having the conversation, what can we change, you know, if we want something to be different, we have to do something different. And then also thinking about, okay, well, if we do this for boreal chickadees, what other species might be kind of losing? Um, and it is tricky and it's complicated and, um, but it is something that, of course, is, is what I do for my career and I don't have any like super simple answers except for that. I think about it all, <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think most ecologists do because it's just sort of how do you get the most conservation bang for your buck? Um, so like in South Africa, their major economic driver is ecotourism. So they get literally hundreds of thousands of people who want to trek through these protected areas every single year which is great, it get, you know, raises awareness about these animals, but also you have to have infrastructure for those people. And you have to um, sort of balance what they need and what the tourists want, which is to see the animals and what the animals need, which is to be left alone by the tourists at times. And so um, just really thinking of carefully about how we allow people to interact in these protected areas. Um, you know, a lot of places will have like a fairly early curfew, which kind of gives the animals the night off so they can do their things after dusk. Um, so that's been a tough one. Like I just I speak with a lot of reserve managers and they're like, well, I get in money to conserve lions, but I really need it to conserve honey badgers and, you know, dikers and some of these like less abundant species. And so you hope that you get enough money in from the umbrella species to cover the rest of the ecosystem. Yeah, that's interesting. Devin asked a question about what drew each of you to conservation outside of caring for animals. What are some other reasons for, for one to pursue a career in conservation? Well, the sixth mass extinction is upon us, unfortunately, um, with climate change happening and just the very distressing uh, decline of wildlife populations. I felt like it was something that I could, you know, really get in and be passionate about and hopefully work to make a difference and protect animals from going extinct because once they're gone, they're gone. Yeah, and uh, that's pretty much what my answer would be to um and uh, I don't know if you want to say a feeling of guilt or, or whatever like you you we can make a difference we can make things better and you need people to as many people as possible to um sort of have that message and not just stand by the wayside and let the bad things happen like like a lot of the loss of biodiversity that's happening and if I can have even just a small part in that um I feel like it'll be a very fulfilling career indeed yeah for sure what I'm curious about how um, all of the disruptions with the pandemic has shaped uh, your research. And I'm wondering if in some ways that you could just keep carrying on because you were you had equipment deployed and sensors and, and all of those things, or if there were any, yeah, were there were how 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 have things been going for the for the last two years? Did you have any experience, any special disruptions or perhaps um, Unex unexpected wins, I guess, through this time. Yeah, so the pandemic was actually strangely beneficial to us because we did already have our cameras out there. The field teams in South Africa were mostly able to get out to the sites. And we had so many more visitors on our online project. So our traffic went up like 500% in the first like 
the beginning part of March 2020. And so I was getting contacted by all kinds of teachers who wanted to use, you know, our data to sort of teach people about ecology and conservation. So we ran through our data really, really quickly. And so I was able to return stuff back around to the reserve managers that much faster. And so it was a, a weird kind of boon for us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, ours was um, tricky. You know, the birds are only here um, from May to June, really. And um, we were still figuring things out in May of 2020. And so we had to get a lot of approvals and uh, we had to scale back some of our research just because we couldn't hire and there was not a lot of traveling. Um, we do some monitoring in Canada and we haven't been doing that the past few years. But, you know, I think all in all, um, it taught us how to be more flexible and thinking about how to do science in an innovative way. And um, we were able to get a lot of analyses done, not going to meetings and a lot of those things that are, you know, kind of handy. Um, but yeah, all in all, I would say it was, uh, it wasn't as big as a disruption as it, it could have been. And I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, I bet. Awesome. All right, last question. It's a fun one. Uh, if you could gain one new piece of data from technology tomorrow, what would that be? Give us your wish list. <laughs> That's oh, a good is, question. This is a thinker. I probably should have given you more time on this one. <laughs> Um, for me, I'll just answer Sarah, like for me, and maybe it's just top of mind because I just talked about it in my talk, but you know, it's a small GPS transmitter that you could put on a small bird like that and just sort of figure out what they're doing consistently, where they're going. It, it's such a mystery still. And um, that, that would be the data I would most want. And I'm like very hopeful that I'll be able to do some things like that in my career at some point in time, but um, it doesn't exist yet, but that's my, that's my hope for my dream data. Yeah, how tiny would it need to be? Hold on, I'm going to interrupt. Like how, like, are we talking like size of a grain of rice? Are you talking about like a watch battery? Like give, give yeah. me a reference. So these guys are about 12 grams and we can't put anything on them um, over 3% of their body weight. And so, um, yeah, uh, some, somewhere between a grain of rice and, <laughs> and a watch battery. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Sarah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. What, what, what's on your wish list? So um, I mentioned this too, but I would love to be able to get video of behavioral interactions because that's the thing we're really missing. Like I can tell when two animals have been at the same camera in quick succession, but I don't know what interactions they had and if one pushed the other off or vice versa. So I would love to be able to get that info. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, with that, I am very grateful to both of you, Alexis and Sarah, for awesome presentations and a really great conversation. I'm also very grateful to our audience who asked so many good questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get them all um, answered today, but please know I'm going to be sharing those with our, our, our two guests. So hopefully everyone in the comforts of their couch or their desk are giving our panelists um, a, a warm round of applause. I'd like to let folks know about a couple of upcoming opportunities, uh, particularly um, as I mentioned on the Bell Museum side, we're celebrating our 150th anniversary and we have a great lineup of programs and exhibits to keep the party going all year long, including a new exhibit called Seeing Birds that's on view now. You can actually see some of these tracking technologies uh, in those, those exhibits, so uh, in that exhibit. So I encourage you to come down. That open exhibit will be open actually until the very beginning of October. It's open now through October. Programmatically, um, coming up on Saturday, February 26th, we have an in-person event at the museum called Spotlight Science, where visitors will have the opportunity to meet researchers who are using different kinds of high-tech tools, things like drones and satellites to study plant diversity across different scales. On Wednesday, March 2nd, we have a virtual program called Birds Through Dakota Eyes. It's led by Chante Maza, um, Neil McKay, who is a, a senior Dakota language specialist here at the U. Uh, and he's gonna be talking about birds and Dakota language and culture. And then on Wednesday, March 23rd, we will be having another virtual program. Hope you can join us for a night in the Bell Museum Collections. It'll be hosted by Emily Grassley. You may know her from her YouTube series and her work at the Field Museum. Uh, she will be in conversation with the Bell Museum scientific curators, and they're going to explore the rare specimens, unique items, and rich stories 
found behind the scenes in our natural history collections. You can register for those and learn more if you go to uh, bellmuseum.umn.edu slash events. On the College of Biological Sciences side, their uh, program called Petri Dish is back in action this spring. Petri Dish explores how biology affects our lives and what it means for our future. No PowerPoints, just lively curiosity-driven conversations on timely topics with University of Minnesota experts. On March 23rd, their event is uh, called Better Living Through Biology, question mark. Uh, and, um, and that's on March 23rd. And on April 27th, uh, the Petri Dish is a matter of fate, the long tail of chemicals in the environment. So you can check those out and we'll probably be sending an email with some follow-up follow stuff. Uh, again, thank you all for the marvelous conversation. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Alexis. Uh, thank you to our audience. Uh, be well and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.